Y... Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie. For those who don't know me already, I head up and this business in Hong Kong. I'm very excited to be hosting our first dedicated Endows Hong Kong webinar. As we're talking about navigating the fixed income markets today, we're bringing you our key partner and the world's largest dedicated fixed income expert, Pimco, to speak with us on this topic. I'm joined today uh, by Endows' co-founder, chairman and CIO, Sam Reed, as well as our guest from Pimco, which I'll let them introduce themselves shortly. But to get things started, We'll first start with our usual disclaimers, um, as we are licensed entities in Hong Kong. Um, and these are the PIMCO disclaimers before we start. Thank you. And um, we'll st I want to highlight that we are actually um, have a Slido that's going on as well. Please uh, go in and submit any questions that you might have um, throughout the webinar. We will be hosting three polls throughout the webinar, and we'll kick start with the first webinar. Um, our first question is, which asset class would you bet to outperform by the end of the year? And we'll take a look at the answers as we progress. And with that, I will start by giving you all a introduction on Endowas for those who are not yet familiar with us um, before I pass our experts to start diving into the meat of the discussion today. So Endows is all about empowering investors, whether it's individuals or families, to help them invest better so that they can live easier today and better tomorrow. We're backed by the world's largest institutional and venture investing investors, including the likes of UBS, the world's largest private bank, Hosu's largest investor, Tencent, Samsung, to name a few. And the name of Endowas means endowment investing for all of us, which is not stock punting but scientific-based strategic asset allocation. And Endows has built a platform for individuals to be able to manage their wealth across asset classes, goals through our platform, which is one that's digital first, not digital only, but advisory led. You're always welcome to schedule an appointment to speak with one of our SFC licensed client advisors. We provide clients access to best in class product, uh, products at low fair cost, for example, we've worked very hard with our partners at PIMCO to get Hong Kong retail investors, as far as I know, for the first time, access to PIMCO's institutional share class funds at their fingertips. We're missional about empowering investors with more knowledge and education, and that's why we run these webinar tracks, and we also produce a lot of insightful content. So if you haven't yet, I would also invite you to subscribe to our Insights blog. Going back to what I mentioned about our mission to help our clients solve for advice, access, and cost, I want to come back to this point on cost. Oftentimes, we only seem to focus on returns, but costs also compound. And we've given you a quick example here. With a $1 million investment, if you save 1% on fees over 30 years, you're gaining close to an additional $2.5 million uh, of gains, which is extremely powerful. But most importantly, this is something that you can control, although you cannot control whether the markets go up or down tomorrow. And to illustrate why I mentioned to you, it's so powerful that we're enabling you, our clients, to be able to access the institutional share class funds of PIMCO. I'm using PIMCO's income fund as an example here. So PIMCO's income fund on a normal retail uh, platform the management fee for the retail share class is 145 basis points, whereas the institutional share class, the same strategy, the management fee is 55 basis points, including the endowment fee, which is an all-in transparent AUM-based fee of 40 basis points to access single funds. And we don't charge any other subscription fees, platform fees, wrap fees. The total all-in cost for you to invest in this fund is 95 basis points. As you can see, you're saving a lot of substantial savings by investing in the same strategy via Endowas. 
Because our business model does not run on commissions, you can be rest assured that we're conflict free and our investment office curates our offerings based on a comprehensive due diligence framework to look for the best in class products, not because we're pocketing a big commission by selling you the product. And with that, I'll pass to Sam to speak more about our fund selection framework. Thank you, Steph, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, it's so exciting that we're launching this in Dallas webinar series here in Hong Kong, um, and really excited also because we have such an amazing, important partner of ours, PIMCO, um, Marcio and Naveen joining us today. So really excited about that. But one of the things that really differentiates and truly sets in Dallas apart is not just a, a cost issue. Uh, while we do provide institutional ac uh, fund and share class access, we provide a framework that is institutional. You know, having been the chief investment officer at Morgan Stanley Investment Management in Asia and the CEO, um, I know how institutional investors um, do their assessment uh, prior to investments. Um, and the you know the institu institutional clients that I talk about are sovereign wealth funds, um, you know, HKMA type investors, uh, endowments like the Yale Endowment. Uh, that we've modeled our business uh, on. Um, and the institutional way of pr pr producing a portfolio or investing into funds is very systematic. Um, and it goes through a process of rigorous due diligence. Um, and that's what we want to bring through the Endowers Investment Office to every individual. It's something that uh, is a service and a value-added service and advisory that no, nobody has really provided to an individual yet. And um, the process, we call it the SMART Plus process, is the proprietary fund selection framework and due diligence for fund managers and also funds. And so it goes through the screen, measure, assess, refine, and track uh, processes. But really what it's about is trying to sieve through all the main thousands of funds that are out there to select what we feel are the best in class products. So the best products produced by the best manufacturers, the fund managers, um, going through a quantitative and qualitative process of assessment by the Endowers Investment Office that is truly independent. We're not swayed by the commissions that fund managers pay, the distribution trailer fees that are paid. Uh, we're not. We're only paid by the client. Any trailer fees that we receive or commissions that we receive is 100% cash back given back to the clients who deserve all of it. Um, and so we don't keep a single cent. And so that allows us to be conflict free. It allows to be aligned to the best interests of the client as a fiduciary. And therefore we can assess each individual fund in each asset class uh, with purely an independent framework uh, that is gonna uh, choose the best in class fund uh, adjusted for the risk that you're taking. And then we set that into a portfolio or a fund uh, selection that is suitable uh, for the client, for the goals and the li future liabilities that they have. So next page. So the key difference of the Endowers Fund Smart Platform versus every other fund platform or bank distributor is this curation process. Just like you know, uh, Amazon would curate or Netflix would curate some content, we would really be take that to another level and build institutional frameworks to screen and do due diligence on the best fund managers like PIMCO. And then within PIMCO's framework, select the best in class products for each category. So if it's global, you know, global ag kind of diversified fixed income exposure, we would put in the global bond fund. If it's an income yield seeking kind of product, then we would go for the PIMCO income fund or if it's an uh, emerging market, high grade, uh, high quality investment grade kind of solution then the emerging market bond fund, for example. But we would not be stuck to just one fund manager. We would actually look across the whole spectrum of all fixed income managers. And we would only choose the PINCO income fund because it is actually the best income product out there. Um, so we see that down from thousands of funds down to maybe a hundred to 200 funds. So you don't have to go out there and look for, you know, search through 20 different U.S. equity funds because Endowers has chosen the best quality, best risk adjusted return and the best lowest cost, uh, especially negotiated uh, with special access and 100% cash back on trailer fees. Next page, please. 
and we are truly independent. So we are the first company uh, and the first fund platform, fund fund distributor, the fir first wealth advisor that can call ourselves independent uh, by the definition of the Hong Kong SFC, uh, because we do not receive a single cent uh, from the product manufacturers. And as a result, we're able to work agnostically with any fund manager. And we actually select the best fund, uh, whereas traditional maybe channels uh, may be incentivized by other reasons. Um, we are purely incentivized by only the client's best interest, the suitability and the risk they're willing to take. And we've broadened that platform, not just in private market, uh, public markets and passive investing, um, but in money market funds, but also we've gone the other direction. And now we've gone into private markets uh, and private equity, private credit. Uh, we're actually launching a you know, professional investor only product um, within the PIMCO range that is really exciting. Um, but you know, multi-strategy hedge funds and other solutions that are um, best in class uh, in both the private and alternative space as well under our Endow's private wealth service. Next page. So I'll hand back to Steph on the services that Endowas is launching in Hong Kong. Thank you, Sam. Now that you know how our investment team curates our best-in-class offerings on our platform, you're welcome to try out the Endowas Hong Kong platform. As Sam already slightly mentioned, um, it's really best-in-class offerings that we only onboard. We're not a supermarket. Um, we have several different offerings on our platform. We offer model portfolios, um, which are already curated by our investment office. Um, there are core portfolios for your diversified core investments. We have income-focused thematic portfolios as well as, as well as cash management portfolios. You can also choose to buy single funds um, through our FundSmart platform. These are all going to be either institutional share class, um, lowest achievable cost uh, access to funds, or as Sam already alluded, retail share class, but we rebate all the trailer fees back to you. And we also as offer a suite of alternative products for professional investors as well. And with that intro to Andawas, I would now again wrap up our, in our first session, which is for those who are not yet familiar with Andawas, please try us out. Um, and I'll remind everyone again that we have a Slido. Please ask, uh, leave any questions that you might have. We'll leave some time for Q&A at the end uh, with our experts from PIMCO. And um, we'll continue with our poll. So it's very interesting. I was just checking the results of our first poll. Seems like our audience feels like a recession might be coming this year. So does that mean it's good for, for fixed income? We'll, we'll see what PIMCO, PIMCO has to say. So with that, I'll pass it to Mark to introduce himself and Navi later and also introduce uh, PIMCO. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, Sam, it's really nice to be here and, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we're really excited today. We were uh, with Endowas in the very beginning back in Singapore. So really excited to be now in this launch in Hong Kong. And it's a great platform. You know, full disclosure, I am an Endowis client as well. Uh, so I see Endowis from the both side, being from a PIMCO, but also as a client. Uh, so very happy to be here and, and see Endowis in Hong Kong. My name is Marcio Bogorisin. Uh, I'm responsible for our wealth management business in Asia X Japan. Uh, I've been at PIMCO since 2010 uh, and moved to, to Asia back in 2018. I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking to you a little bit of PIMCO, our investment process, and then hand it over to Naveen Gulati, uh, who is our head of Hong Kong Wealth Management. He's a senior vice president uh, and has been at PIMCO since 2014. Uh, so with that, uh, Steph, maybe we go to our first page on, on the PIMCO overview. I know many of you are familiar with PIMCO. Uh, for those who are might not be as familiar, uh, we are the, the largest active fixed income manager in the world. Uh, as you can see here, we manage 1.8 trillion uh, in assets, uh, and we've been around for 50 years. Our headquarters is in Newport Beach, California, but as you can see here in this map, we do have a global presence. Interesting enough, our first office outside of the U.S., actually outside of Newport Beach, was in Singapore in 1990. Five, uh, 96, uh, and we have been in the region uh, in Asia for, for quite a, some time. When we look at the next slide, 
a lot of people ask, what is the secret sauce of PIMCO? Like, what, how can PIMCO be delivering good results, you know, almost year over year? Like, what is the secret sauce? And I always tell them it is our investment process. So that's why I would like to spend a little bit of time here to explain to you how this investment process works. So being in fixed income, one of the most important thing for us is to get the macroeconomic environment right. Because macroeconomic environment is very important for investing in general, but specifically for fixed income. So at PIMCO, as you can see here in the top left, we start with our macroeconomic forums, which we hold these forums four times a year. All the investment professionals at PIMCO, they get together and discuss what will be our views for the next three to five years in our May, what we call the secular forum. And then for the other quarters is our cyclical forums and our views for the next six to 12 months. So here we're discussing GDP growth, inflation, monetary policy, fiscal policy, risks, and to really have a good view on what's gonna happen in the world and how should we be thinking about investments. Because the market and current events happens every day, we need to be tactical and dynamic in the portfolios. And with that, as you can see on the, on the top right, we have our investment committee, which is a group of the most senior portfolio managers at PIMCO, and they meet four times a week, so Monday to Thursday for two hours. So here they're discussing the current events, they're bringing in experts of different views, fields to really see like, is there any change to our view? Are there any tweaks to the portfolio? How should we be managing this portfolio a, on a daily basis? And again, we're an active fixed income manager, so we're actively managing this portfolio on a daily basis. So once we have the macro, the top down, pretty you know, in line with our view, and we, we, we think we, we have a base case, and then is how do you invest? Where do your ideas come from? And that's when, as you can see here, the bottom up comes in. So at PIMCO, we have over 300 portfolio managers across the globe, plus 80 credit analysts. So every single bond that goes into a portfolio, a credit analyst has reviewed that bond. And every single bond or security that goes into a portfolio, a portfolio manager has worked with a credit analyst to see if it makes sense to go in. So when we really put the top down and the bottom up together, that's how we select what region we're gonna invest, what sectors we're gonna invest, and most importantly, what specific companies and bonds we're gonna be buying for the portfolios. And again, this is our secret sauce, and it's something that we've been doing you know, since the very beginning. So one thing that you might think is, okay, great, but to really get the macroeconomic environment right, there's a lot of people out there trying to do that, and how will PIMCO differentiate itself? And this is where it's not only about, you know, the PIMCO people and people that we hire, but who we surround ourselves with. And because of that, we created our global advisory board uh, uh, some years ago. So if we go to the next slide, thank you. The global advisory board at PIMCO, it's really experts and their specific field that they come together and they help us think about the macroeconomic environment. This, this advisory board is chaired by you know, Ben Bernanke, who many of you know used to be uh, the, the Fed's uh, chair in the US. There are some other names like Gordon Brown, who used to be the UK prime minister, uh, Mark Carney, and of course, from an Asia perspective, you know, An Kok Song, who was the CIO for GIC for many years. So these group of people, they're coming to our forums, they're coming to the investment committee meetings and challenging our views. If Ben Bernanke tells you, hey, you might be getting inflation call wrong, you might be thinking the Fed will do this, but they might be doing something else, he is an expert in his field. And so somewhere that we would you know, rethink or, or consider his thoughts and put that into the investment process. So this is a really, interesting and important part of our investment process and that I wanted to share with you. And someone that is not in this slide is Richard Clarida, Rich Clarida. So Rich Clarida, as many of you know, he was the vice chairman of the Fed and he just ended his term in the middle of last year. Prior to joining the Fed, Rich Clarida was actually our economist uh, sitting in New York. And 
he was at PIMCO, he went to the Fed, and we, ha- and we were very lucky for him to rejoin us at the end of last year. So now Rich Clarida is part of PIMCO again. And just thinking that he was in the Fed, you know, 10 months ago, he can really provide us good insights on how is the Fed thinking about inflation? How is the Fed thinking about raising rates or keeping rates steady or even cutting rates? So that is really important for us when we're building portfolios, when we're making decisions on behalf of our clients. And we really pride ourselves to be really focusing on always getting these thought leaders as part of our investment process. So this is a little bit about PIMCO. If you wanna hear more about us, you know, you can go to our website. You know, Naveen and I were also happy to join a call if you want with your Endowist team. Uh, but now I'll hand it over to Naveen. He will touch a little bit more on our current views. So we just had our forum. So he will touch on what our current views and what does that mean uh, in terms of investment implications. So over to you, Naveen. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Marcio. And also thank you to, to Steph and Sam. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So as Marcio mentioned, you know, we spend a lot of time here at PIMCO trying to get the macro right. Uh, because, of course, macro is a huge factor in trying to understand what go forward returns are both across fixed income and equity and then within individual sectors you know what parts of the fixed income market perhaps are going to outperform versus underperform so we spent a lot of time here and so with that uh, just to kick things off i want to give you a, a quick overview of what is pimco's macro outlook for the next six to 12 months so if you think about what 2022 was which i know is now a you know painful memory for some 2022 started the year especially here in hong kong with uh, you know, pretty big COVID outbreaks uh, and the really beginning of the end of COVID, and then very quickly transitioned into a story about Russia and Ukraine crisis, which led to uh, you know uh, an exacerbation of supply chain issues, especially in energy, which resulted in very high inflation, uh, which ultimately caused the Fed, uh, forced the Fed to really raise rates to get inflation under control, and so. Uh, 2022, as a result of that, was a very painful year in markets as while the Fed was raising rates, it was you know, creating a very large risk off sentiment that caused both equities and fixed income to sell off significantly. Now, 2023 is a, a very different situation, right? From a COVID perspective, uh, clearly COVID is, is no longer uh, the issue it was even a year ago. Of course, it's still you know, ever present, but nonetheless does not affect markets the way it once did, nor day-to-day life. And also inflation, uh, given some of the Fed's effort, as well as a you know, general um, mending of supply chain issues post-COVID, we've begun to see inflation begin trending down as well. Right, inflation peaked in most of the developed world around 10%. Uh, it's now, you know, mid 4%, depending on what number you're looking at, but you know, nearly half of what it was at the peak. Uh, at the same time, uh, what was a really historic Fed rate hike cycle has begun to show its teeth in terms of economic implications in a variety of different sectors. The most notable of which, which many of you have felt yourself, is in the banking sector. And so, whether that be Silicon Valley Bank in the U.S or ultimately you know, Credit Suisse uh, being absorbed by UBS. Uh, clearly these are pretty dramatic things that happen very quickly and it's you know, nearly a direct result of, of that Fed's tightening cycle. And so where does that leave us today for the next six to 12 months, right? It leaves us in a, a pretty unique situation. On one hand, uh, clearly the economy is beginning to show signs of slowing down and you know, you've seen these credit defaults as, in the banking sector as this an example of that. Uh, but furthermore, we're seeing some of the underlying bottom-up data show that there is some slowing, both here in Asia uh, and in China, as the you know the reopening is has begun to cool off. But as well as in the developed markets is uh, too, where you know people aren't spending the money that they perhaps were in in 2021, particularly as a lot of the COVID stimulus is has begun to come off. And as a result of that, you know, a couple different factors are at work. On one hand, you can see on the left side of the page here, we do think that we're heading into recession, very similar to, the, to, to what the poll result was earlier. And we do think that by year end, especially in most developed markets, we will be in some form of recession. Not a severe one, not one that's going to feel like 2008, but one where, you know, there's more people, you know, slowing down than, than speeding up. Uh, But as a result of that, it has actually put the Fed for the first time in a while in a pretty comfortable position. And what I mean by that is the Fed was very urgently trying to raise rates to slow down the economy. Uh, And when you raise rates, really what you're trying to do is slow down credit growth. Uh, And so that has, has for the most part, worked 
But then further to that, given the banking crisis, uh, banks themselves are pulling back and slowing down credit growth on their own balance sheets, which all in all is generally going to lead to a, a you know, softening of the economy, which on its own will allow uh, inflation to trend down more naturally. And finally, I'd say the last big factor here is on the fiscal side. And I know, you know the debt ceiling is, is a topic that's been very uh, important for the last couple of weeks, but clearly there's a change in fiscal policy standpoint, meaning that you know, while fiscal policy and, and governments were coming to the rescue post COVID and very quick to, to get into a lot of stimulus, now it's a very different situation where they're actually pulling back some of that stimulus and especially ahead of what will be a 2024 contentious election in the US, uh, they're no longer you know, wanting to create that sense of moral hazard which you know, for the last couple of years has been actually quite supportive of, of asset markets. And so you know, main takeaways here are that one, uh, the economy is slowing down, we're heading into recession, but we do think the Fed tightening cycle, the Fed raising rates is likely now to be over. So what does that mean for markets, right? If we go to the next page, just to put 2022 uh, in a little bit of context, what you can see in this page is, is the drawdowns historically, uh, the top half being the historical drawdowns over the last 20 years in global investment grade credit markets, so bond markets more generally. And then the bottom half of the page shows you, you know, drawdowns over the last 20 years in the equity markets. And what you can see in 2022, it was painful across both, right? Bond markets at the peak were down 18 to 20%. Equity markets at the peak were down around 25%. And while you know 25 is bigger than than 18, uh, at the same time, in a historical uh, historical comparison, you can see that the bond drawdown at the top half of the page was actually quite historic. You know, in the last 25 years, you hadn't seen a drawdown uh, of that size ever. And in fact, the last one was you know around the 70s or 80s, nearly 40, 50 years ago. Versus in equities, you can see on the bottom half, the drawdown in equities was actually not that significant uh, in the grand scheme of things, right? The 2020 drawdown in March 2020 and COVID started was much bigger. Uh, of course, 2008 was much, much bigger at minus 50, minus 60%. And then, of course, on the tech bubble birth in 2001, it was similarly down 50% too. And so, you know, I think it's important to put this in context uh, when we think about bonds versus equities. 2022 painful for both, but actually the drawdown in, in bonds was much more significant than the drawdown in equities. And so that creates a unique environment looking forward. And that's what the next page is about. You know, because of the you know, very significant drawdown in bond markets last year, it's actually setting up a very good go forward environment for bonds uh, over the next year. And so we can see on this page as a comparison of the overall yield to maturity of various parts of the fixed income market, uh, both at the end of 2021, December 31st, 2021, versus where it was you know, just here at the end of April. And what you can see is that the yield to maturity uh, or yield to worse, what we're showing here, has significantly gone up in nearly every part of the fixed income market. For example, you can see at the top in dark blue, US core bonds, agency mortgages, yields in these markets have gone up from roughly one and a half to now about four and a half. And then if you look at securitized markets, you know, from about 2% to 5%, investment grade similar two to five, and then in high yield from, from around four to seven. So there's been a very significant boost in the yield to maturity across these markets, which is a very good thing for you know, go forward investors as the starting yield to maturity that an investor buys in at is typically the, a very good predictor of what the next five year return is. And so you know, here at PIMCO, what we think about when we look at this page is that even in the highest quality parts of the market, US core, agency, MBS, et cetera, you're earning today you know, four, five, 6% yields, which is what we're able to deliver in, you know, across a variety of our funds without actually taking much credit risk at all. In fact, you're you know, typically in AAA or AA type securities, and you can get that five to six, and in some cases, even 7% yield. And that's very unique, right? If you look back just a year and a half ago at the end of 2021, you can see it on this page, high yield credit was yielding over three, you know, just 3.8%. So you're getting even higher yield than high yield credit was a year and a half ago with taking much, much less risk. And if you turn to the next page, uh, just a little idea around you know, fixed income versus cash, right? I've been talking about how yields have gone up pretty significantly in the bond market, but I'm sure some of you online are thinking, well, you know, so have cash rates, right? Deposit rates have gone up too, but I just stay in cash or is really now a time to be in bond funds. And what you can see on this page is a couple of, of charts, uh, but the high level message is while 
you know, while the Fed was actually raising rates, it was a good move to have been in cash. But now that the Fed, based on our macro view, is approaching the end of its rate hike cycle and as soon will you know, potentially pivot to cutting rates, especially if we hit a harder economic uh, recession that's currently predicted, that should lead to outsized returns in the fixed income markets as opposed to the cash markets. And that's what you can see on the right side of the page. What we show here is, is you know, across various hiking cycles over the last you know, few decades, what you can see is that you know, when the bars are, are showing red below the zero line, that's when cash has significantly outperformed. And when it's green, it's when bonds have significantly outperformed cash. And what you can see generally is that bonds outperform cash typically around four months before the peak uh, Fed rate, which is almost exactly where we think we are now. So we actually think this is a very good entry point for fixed income, especially because, you know, earlier this year, you know, we had a lot of our clients telling us, well, you know, the 10 year was at 3.8, 4%. This is a good time, but then as it dropped to, to 3.4 um, just a couple of weeks ago, people were saying, well, did I miss that opportunity? Now the Fed rates are, or the you know, 10-year Treasury rates have gone back up to 3.8%, but opportunity has presented itself once again. And so we do think this is a great go-forward environment for fixed income uh, and one where you know, a lot of, of potentially good returns can be done, particularly in a downside economic environment where the Fed is forced to cut rates, and then you should see capital gains on top of the yield to maturity that you're buying in on. Now, that takes us to the next slide, which is a question around, you know, how do you actually invest, right? Because there's a lot of temptation, especially in a market like this, to say, well, you know, 5% in IG, 6% in ID is something that I really like, but should I go into high yield uh, and potentially get 7%, right? And in this type of environment, you know, having been uh, principally a bond manager for the last 50 years, you know, this type of environment, there's, there's an investment philosophy that, that works in our view uh, when you're in this part of the business cycle. One, we think it's really important to capture you know, income uh, through multiple sources. And what I mean by that is don't put all your eggs in the investment grade credit basket. Don't necessarily put all your eggs in the high yield basket. Now is the time where you want some flexibility, both in terms of credit quality, but also in terms of uh, sector and individual companies, you want to have that diversification because it's, you know, there's surprises around the corner in, in bad economic environments. And I think Credit Suisse is a very good example where, you know, you don't want all your, um, you know, all your cash and potentially just one or two names. You instead want to be in multiple sources of income uh, uh, within the bond market uh, overall. Second, you can see here that, you know, it's important time to have flexibility. So what you'll notice here at PIMCO, and this is something Marcio touched on as well, is that we are an active manager here at PIMCO. So we do nothing passively. And so there are parts of the market or parts of an index where we think, you know, yeah, it's part of the index, but it's not something that you necessarily want to own today heading into a recession. So that should be a sector or a company or et cetera that you should be avoiding. So you need strategies that are flexible and active uh, as well as diversified, which I mentioned earlier, um, especially when you're heading into the recession. And finally, it's, you know, focusing on high quality and resilience. You know, there's a time and place for high octane, high yield type strategies, but now is not that. Now is a time for, you know, capturing what we think are really attractive yields in the high quality parts of the bond market, uh, and hopefully capturing some capital gains on top of that, uh, if and when the Fed pivots, uh, probably sometime next year. So in that context, if we turn to the next page, uh, there's three funds here that we particularly want to highlight, right? And, you know, of course, as Sam was mentioning earlier, there's many funds uh, that we have on, on the Endowist platform, uh, but there are times and places for some. Uh, and, you know, here are three that we think are, are particularly good, right, uh, given where we are in the economic environment. And so the three funds I'd highlight here, you can see from left to right, are first the GIS Global Bond Fund. Next, the GIS Income Fund, and lastly, the GIS Asia Strategic Interest Bond Fund. Now, these all have a very different flavor and I think achieve different objectives in a portfolio, right? So if you think about what is that first fund, the GIS Global Bond Fund, I would think of this as your highest quality type bond fund. You can see the average quality at the bottom is, is double A. Uh, it's yielding a five and a half percent yield right now. And the goal of this fund is to structurally have some interest rate exposure. So that should benefit when the you know, Fed potentially cuts rate, but also really focus on just those high quality parts of the bond market. So think government guaranteed securities, both in terms of sovereign debt, but as well as uh, agency mortgages. And then finally, in the credit space, really only investment grade credit. So really just top quality um, types of exposures that are producing a pretty attractive all in yield today of five and a half. Uh, but will provide the most upside if we go into a hard recession 
and the Fed uh, cuts rates. That should lead to pretty good capital gains in this strategy. The next fund in the middle, uh, the GIS Income Fund, is what I call PIMCO's flagship, and it was the one that, that Sam and Steph had mentioned earlier. Uh, it's one that has been incredibly popular both for the last couple of decades, but also more so you know, this year as we've seen really significant inflows in this strategy. And this is a fund that is often a core allocation, a core bond allocation in investors' portfolios. Uh, it's one where PIMCO uses uh, you know, its flexibility to really find those best high conviction opportunities across the global fixed income markets. And so it doesn't just focus on high quality, doesn't focus on low quality, what instead depending on where we are in the market cycle and depending on where our hundreds of PMs and credit analysts are, are seeing the best opportunity, this fund will flexibly go without a benchmark approach and flexibly invest in those, in those markets uh, to kind of capture those best income returns. And so what you can see right now is the yield on that fund as a result of its flexibility and a result of being able to take on a little bit more risk, uh, the all-in yield is around six and a half, so about a percent higher than the global fund, uh, but a little bit lower quality at, at roughly A plus versus double A, but still overall very high quality. The last fund I'll talk about is the GIS Asia Strategic Interest Bond Fund on the right. Now, this is a, you know, similar to the income fund, it's, a, it's an income oriented um, strategy, but instead of focusing on global developed markets primarily, it instead focuses primarily on Asia credit markets. So if you wanna invest in your backyard here in Asia, uh, and you want a strategy that has potential to capture some upside on the Asia reopening theme or China reopening theme, this is that. And you know, given some of what's been a tough macro environment uh, in China, uh, it, we've seen the yield of the strategy go up significantly. It's currently around 8.1% with a you know, duration profile roughly similar to the income fund, but a little bit lower quality at, at triple B plus versus double A. But this is gonna be again, a, a IG average quality um, income oriented Asia approach. And so what you can see here is that there's a lot of different flavors of fixed income, but I think what all these funds in, have in common is that right now they are focusing on that higher quality space. And there are those that you know, have the flexibility to really move around tactically on your behalf uh, to take advantage of, of opportunities, both with what the Fed's doing, but also in terms of you know, very quick moves in credit markets today. So with that, I'll, I'll close. Um, you know, I think the main takeaways from PIMCO now is that you know, PIMCO is a, a uh, clearly a firm with a lot of resources. And what we hope to do with those resources is you know, have a, a really strong macro and bottom-up investment process uh, and look forward at what you know, the, the opportunity is. And right now we think heading into recession, the opportunity is in high quality bonds. And so we're, we're quite bullish there and excited about, uh, about this high quality bond set that we have today. I'll pass it now back to Sam. That for me. <laughs> We have, uh, I can just do it, Slido uh, ongoing. There's a lot of questions. Uh, the great thing about Slido is that you can actually vote up the questions that you want answered first. So we'll take it from the top and uh, we have one more uh, poll that we're gonna do, right? Steph? Yeah. You're still muted. Yes, yes, we should be doing our final poll. We switched up the order, the uh, last the poll page. and I'm this page yeah, yeah the yeah. we switched up the order so we already did this question the the the, new, the latest <laughs> question that we're doing is and i think um uh, marcio and naveen in their session alluded to it um i think pimco's view we kind of get it we're asking what everyone thinks the fed rate will be at the end of the year i think i heard Na naveen said they think it has peaked and potentially might be rate cuts next year so let's see where everyone think it will be Mm, sounds good. Can we, Steph, go back very quickly to the interest rate chart because there is a question on Slido. And before we wrap it up on this one, um, you know, is there? Uh, sorry, that one, that one earlier, the Fed fund rate expectation. Which one? Sorry about that. Next one. Next one. Next this one. one. Okay. No, down, down. Yeah, this one. Down. Fed. This one. Okay. Um, so this is the left-hand chart. And I think that, you know, since then, maybe uh, more recent updated charts will probably push this expectation out a little bit that, you know, we'll probably see the Fed not cutting rates sooner, but maybe later. And the big, like the most highest expectation is actually the first quarter of next year. Um, the majority have moved from end of this year to beginning of next year, I think. So just, you know, to the PIMCO team, 
there is a question on the Slido. The first top one is, what is PIMCO's house view on where rates will be this year and next year? I don't know if you explicitly have interest rate forecasts, but maybe you can talk about, if you don't have explicit forecasts, um, what the rate forecast looks like in terms of what the house view is. Yeah, sure. Happy to take that question. You know, we, we definitely have rate forecasts as this is our, uh, it, you know, we spent a lot of time here trying to figure out, you know, not just what the Fed's going to do, but also uh, around, you know, what the whole yield curve is going to do. Because of course you can yeah. buy bonds at the front end of the curve, but you can buy bonds, you know, further out in the curve as well. And so, you know, here at PIMCO, uh, it, the view is a little bit more, a little bit nuanced. First, I think on the Fed, uh, we don't think that they're likely to cut this year, like as in the next six months, but we do think once recession, or, or sorry, once recession is a little bit more obvious, and once inflation has broken that three percent level, uh, you know, two point nine, two point eight, that's when the Fed's going to be much more comfortable in cutting rates. And so we think the earliest that happens is likely Q1, so roughly aligned with the market. Uh, but the good thing is the market has already readjusted for this. And so, you know, the 10 year as an example was 3.45% just a couple of weeks back. Uh, it's now 3.8%. And that to us is a much more attractive entry point uh, for fixed income uh, than just even a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the thing that we need to highlight again is that, you know, there is a difference between what the Fed fund rates are and what the market rates are, because the market throughout this whole tightening cycle has moved well ahead of the Fed, you know, almost like two percentage points higher than where the Fed fund rates are at, at certain points in the cycle. And so, you know, Fed has been kind of behind the curve, they've raised rates, but the market has reflected that real time very quickly. Um, and so the market is reflecting all of these changes at the margin that is happening very, very quickly. And so um, right now, as rates climb back up, um, and, you know, fixed income markets have seen a bit of a correction. This is probably another great opportunity for us to re-enter uh, the fixed income market. With that, I'm going to go down to the slide, Steph, um, maybe back down to where we were, post the Slido, and, and just introduce to you, um, because Naveen showed us, whoops, wrong page. <laughs> yeah, so Naveen showed us three of the uh, the highlighted funds that PIMCO has. This is actually the Endowed Fund Smart Investment Fund list page, what it looks like. You can actually use the left-hand side filter to screen for different, you know, um, asset classes, different, you know, dividend type payouts, you know, fund manager names, investment styles and geography, et cetera, to filter out what, the, what kind of funds that you, you're looking for. And then on the top, you see that for professional investors only, this is the full range of retail funds. Uh, that we have on offer, but we also have some pri uh, professional investor solutions um, on our Endowers Private Wealth uh, service uh, for uh, professional investors in Hong Kong. Um, so just wanted to highlight this. So you can buy a single fund um, as an independent um, provider of this service. We are pretty much the lowest cost um, service provider in Hong Kong for buying a single mutual fund. Uh, but what we also do is provide, you know, portfolio solutions. So if you go a couple of pages down, um, you can see the model portfolios that are available. So these are top tier funds. We brought them together into a portfolio. Um, and these are model portfolios created by the investment office, optimized um, and, you know, um, best in class solutions brought together into a portfolio. And some of it would include private markets and alternatives. These lists, the, uh, the list that I've shown of core portfolios for global core, which is a globally diversified, low cost um, you know, solution, uh, cash management. Um, we have CashMart Secure and CashMart, um, you know, the, the, the very uh, risk averse one, and then a little bit more risk for higher yield. Um, to manage your short-term cash and liquidity, and then the passive income portfolios. So three risk levels of cash payout targeting four to seven, eight percent um, that gives you passive income uh, on fixed income exposures. And we have PIMCO products in the global portfolio, in the passive income portfolios as well. And then we have satellite portfolios for in investors who want to have this core satellite strategy um, and selecting market opportunities like China equities, like sustainability, ESG, life future trends, and global technology. 
we'll have a lot more model portfolios coming your way. Uh, and the model portfolios are exactly that. It's a model on the FundSmart platform that gives you a, a certain ratio and allocation to the underlying funds that build the portfolio. But you can actually tweak it. You can actually change the portfolio, switch the funds in and out. Uh, you can actually build your own DIY portfolio with multiple funds from asset allocation across equities and fixed income as well. So there's complete flexibility. And the moment you allocate to the underlying funds, uh, it gives you historical tra track record of the overall portfolio, uh, the underlying breakdown of the overall portfolio. Even if you included like up to eight funds, you will have that breakdown immediately. So you have a lot of flexibility. It's the best analytical tool for building uh, fund portfolios out there. And again, once again, is the lowest cost uh, available with the 100% cash back and institutional fund access. Next page, please. And so, you know, one chart that I did want to like throw out there and, you know, make it a discussion point with Marcia and Naveen is this idea of a 60-40 portfolio. Because last year, as we all know, it was one of the worst years for 60-40 uh, or any kind of balanced portfolios because both equities and fixed income had double digit losses. Um, but this year, you've actually seen that rebound very quickly because not just fixed income, but equities has shown a rebound. But I think this discussion is very um, timely because as we've seen a double-digit return in equities, as concerns about you know, returns in equities um, uh, with the recession um, you know, being front and center in our mindset, you know, where does fixed income um, come into play? Um, and if we look at the historical track record in a recession, um, where there is equities that has gone down double digits in a, during a recession, fixed income has actually been flat. And every other scenario of an expansionary or a dis declining kind of growth scenario, after the Fed interest rates have peaked, every other scenario, fixed income has actually done well. Um, so in a 60-40 portfolio, the role of the fixed income uh, asset allocation becomes very, very important, especially from here onwards in the cycle. Um, so with that, I, I do want to ask Marcia and Naveen, I don't know who wants to take these questions, but you know, with the uncertainties, with recession, uh, with geopolitics, you know, how are the risks factored into constructing a fixed income fund uh, that uh, PIMCO has, you know, and you can use a global or a PIMCO income uh, product uh, as an example. That's one of the that's currently the top ranking question. No, great. Sounds good. So maybe I'll answer your 6040 and I'm looking at Slido as well. So I, I saw that that question coming too. So maybe for the 6040, we, we did a lot of analysis on this. And whenever the 6040 portfolio does not work, it's on a high inflation when the Fed is raising rates, right? And the reason for that is equities are going down because rates are going up. Uh, and, and when rates go up, fixed income gets also impacted, right? So the worst year for 6040 is when, again, high inflation, because of high inflation, the Fed has to start increasing rate aggressively. If you think about a recessionary environment, what typically happens in a recessionary environment is earnings, company earnings starts to slow down. So equities tend to not do well and do poorly in a recessionary environment. And investors, they tend to move from equity to fixed income because they go to the safe haven. And because of that dynamic, fixed income tends to do well uh, and better in a fixed uh, in a recessionary environment, right? So again, that's why if your base case is for potential recession in the US, like our base case is, we think that fixed income should do well or at least better than equities over the next few months, potentially year. Um, so that's that's that for that. I saw the question on the risk, right? There's a lot of risks out there. And I think one thing that we need to keep in mind is when we think about black swan events, black swan events are those things that happen and nobody was really thinking about it, or maybe it was this low probability and these events should be happening once every 100 years, right? If you think about what happened over the last three years, we had COVID, uh, which was a black swan event. 
we had the war uh, in Ukraine, which, you know, some people say they could see that coming, but others didn't. And then we had more recently a lot of banks failing uh, globally, right? So these are three pretty drastic black swan events that happened in three years, right? So the biggest takeaway of that is diversification. So answering specifically the question uh, and, and Slido is, during our foreign process, we do identify these risks. So during our foreign process, we do say, hey, we might want to avoid this region. We might avoid this sector. We might want to be higher quality. We might want to avoid this specific company as we are pricing in or we're assessing the risks that are out there. However, there might be black swan events and you cannot have a crystal ball and understand and know that they're coming. So that's why we talk a lot about diversification. If you look at the, the income fund, that, that fund will have thousands of bonds, which means that even if we get something wrong, you might have a very small impact of, you know, 0.25%, you know, max half a percent but you're not losing all of your money if you had all of your money in that specific bond. So diversification is one of the best tools when it comes to risk management. And that's why our funds are very well diversified. And to Naveen's point, active management with diversification where you're actually actively avoiding the risks that you're seeing out there and then diversifying in case there's a black swan event that you, you don't have a crystal ball to know it's coming. Hmm. Great. Thanks so much, Marcio. Um, actually, I'm going to combine these two questions. One is the combination of subsectors within fixed income. Uh, what are the subsectors that are good defensive plays if the U.S. goes into recession? I was actually looking at the performances of PINCO funds and income, PINCO income year to date, and also global high yield has done surprisingly well. <laughs> um, so that was surprising. But um, the other question that's out there, you know, and you touched on it is on, on the corporate bonds, mm -hmm. you know, investment grade um, it, it is not on the, you know, we, we didn't mention that before, but, you know, how, how do you position investment grade within kind of the subsectors and the priorities? Um, and, you know, how does that position versus high yield on one side and income generating and, you know, core kind of products on the other side? Sure. Yeah. So I'll take that one. Uh, you know, investment grade right now, there's good value, but there's even better value in, I'd say, even higher quality securitized assets, which is another quote, another question there on the Slido. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, when you say the word securitized, I think it's often a confusing one uh, as investors, you know, wonder, what are you buying there? Are you buying you know, the things with a lot of default risks that are complicated derivatives, et cetera. But actually what we're finding really attractive today is something that's much more simple than that. It's securitized agency mortgages. And securitized agency mortgages is for people who are less familiar. You know, in the US, the way the, the real estate market works is you go to the bank, uh, you put 20% down on a house, they give you a mortgage. And then if you meet certain criteria, that bank actually sells that mortgage to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, which are government agencies. And then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac package those into a securitized agency mortgage and sell it to the market with a guarantee from their balance sheet that it can't default. And so when you're buying that asset class, you're actually buying one uh, that doesn't have any credit risk. So you can't lose money. The only thing that you you know that is uncertain is those underlying homeowners. They have the right to pay back that loan early uh, if they want. And so typically, something like agency mortgages is something that you know pays you a little bit more than U.S. Treasuries. But right now, it's paying you nearly one percent more than U.S. Treasuries. And you know, think about that in context. Pre-COVID, investing grade credit only paid you one percent over Treasuries as well. And so you're getting, you know, this great, almost like investment grade credit like return in these agency mortgages, which actually have no credit risk and have zero chance of default. And so to us, that's a home run. And so it's not that we don't like investment grade credit. In fact, we still own you know, a very big chunk of it. Uh, but we have a preference for some of these securitized assets, particularly the government guaranteed ones that we think uh, provide you know, a similar type upside with, with very little downside because of that government guarantee. And the product to get exposure 
to that um, is probably the PIMCO Income Fund, which has an overweight to securitized. Yeah, it will be both that PIMCO Income Fund as well as the Global Bond Fund uh, that we mentioned earlier. That will have the government guaranteed mortgages as well. Yeah, fantastic. I think there was a question, but it kind of disappeared, even though I wanted to answer it was, you know, Sam and Marcio, you know, should I, what should I do with the 6040 or something? It disappeared. And then there's an anonymous question is what to do with my money now? Uh, and it's, these are the kind of like uh, questions that are very, very difficult for us to answer, um, either as a fund manager or as an advisor uh, that in Dallas is. But, you know, this chart about the 6040 tells us a very telling story that, um, you know, I said this in previous webinars before that fixed income, ne uh, you know, if it generates negative returns for two consecutive years, as it did, um, in recent years, in 2021 and 22, is never repeated a third year in the history of mankind, actually. So it's actually not surprising that this year is actually turning out to be not a bad year. The second thing is from a cyclical perspective, fixed income markets actually bottomed at the end of last year in October. So since October, generally, I mean, yeah, different sub sectors and asset classes have moved differently, but and different funds have performed at different levels, but largely the sector, the asset class bottomed around October, let's say last year. So way ahead of when the Fed market, Fed interest rate peaked, in a way, you know, somewhat um, even the market interest rates peaked way earlier in October too. And so from that perspective, a lot of the risks and the concerns that people had uh, have been priced into the market. Um, with inflation coming off now, um, it's probably likely that fixed income remains the preferred asset class. So rather than 60-40, I've talked about in our in-house web webinars to flip that around and say, have a preference of fixed income and then have a 40-60. That's the more balanced kind of portfolio to have at this point in the cycle is to overweight fixed income, um, have some exposure to equities because it is climbing a wall of worry. You never know when the market is bottomed. It may have already priced in the uh, recession and, and have bottomed already. We don't know that. And this year, the, the market has returned double digits. Um, so having some exposure to equity and having a recurring investment, long-term mindset of having a regular savings plan is the right way to approach this. Uh, but right now, if I had to, I would probably overweight uh, fixed income over equities. And within fixed income, Focus on the subsectors, you know, the ones that Naveen mentioned, like securitized assets, you know, uh, core allocation um, across the, the the duration as well it is also something that we should definitely do. Anything to add from Marcio and Naveen on that before we wrap up? I think that's right, Sam. I think you, you nailed it. I saw a question on ETFs, and uh, I'm just tempted to just answer that if you if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. And and I feel like it's interesting because it, it, it says why shouldn't I keep buying ETFs? ETFs are funds, right? It's exchange traded funds. So I, I think the the question here is, the point is, you know, not all ETFs are the same. You have active ETFs, you have passive ETFs, you have ETFs that are cheaper than funds, you have ETFs that are more expensive than funds. So I think when you think about ETFs, you really have to, to look at it. Um, as I think Sam and, and Stephanie mentioned, like in Dallas, they're curating your funds here for you. And when you think about ETFs, you, you should think about that curation as well. Uh, because again, they're, they're funds, they're the same funds, but they, they're listed in, a, in an exchange. When it comes to fixed income, uh, you know, it, it's proven that active fixed income beats passive ETFs over the long run. Um, and just because fixed income, you know, it's a little more complex. Uh, you know, a company might have one or two stocks uh, where a company might have, you know, 30 bonds outstanding, right? And that ETF might be buying just one bond where you might find value, you know, somewhere else. So that's how I would think about ETFs. Like not all ETFs are, are created equally. Uh, and then what, you're, what are you trying to achieve by an ETF versus an active fund? Uh, and again, for, for fixed income, uh, it's proven that you know, active management beats passive in the long run. So anyway, so I just wanted to make that comment, but back to you, Sam, I know we're, we're almost on time here. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic topic that we should definitely address. And Steph, maybe we can stop sharing the slides um, because so we can see Marcio and Nuveen's face finally. 
because you were like tiny thumbnails. We couldn't even see you. Uh, but but actually, that that's a super interesting point because as as Marcio highlighted, uh, historically, seventy five percent of equity active managers underperform, and that's why people say, "Hey, you should do passive investing." Uh, and ETFs are an efficient form, but it's an open ended mutual fund that's listed on exchange. That's why it's an exchange traded fund. But there are open-ended mutual funds that are low cost and attractive, especially if you remove the trailer fees, um, that are lower cost than ETFs. So it's 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 not uh, always the more efficient way to even access a fund. Um, secondly, like I said, 75% of active equity funds under, uh, underperform. But I think PIMCO's research showed that 75% or 70%, depending on where you cut it, of active you know, fixed income managers actually do the same or better. Um, and PIMCO funds, actually, the bulk of them outperform. Um, so I think that as a trusted advisor, uh, you know, independent, not affected, we're not paid by PIMCO. Uh, so we can actually say that, you know, active management in fixed income actually does make a lot of sense, especially if you can access it at low cost. That's critically important, especially when yields are lower. These days, yields are much higher, but when yields are lower in previous cycles in you know, the early two, the 2010s and 2020s, that cycle, you need to, the code low cost really to help you achieve better yield uh, and better outcomes. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap up today, uh, Steph, um, but want to tell you to go down here on YouTube, click subscribe to the Endowers Hong Kong uh, YouTube website. Uh, there's also links um, so that you can sign up to endow us uh, with a discounted code, I believe. Um, so you get discounted fees. Uh, you can also um, set up appointments to talk to our SFC regulated um, licensed uh, client advisors who are here for you. Um, many of the questions were fantastic questions. But you can directly address, be addressed, um, and have those answered by our client advisors. So, with that, I'm going to hand back to Steph. Anything else you want to add, Steph? Um, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Marcio. Thank you, Naveen. I think Sam highlighted a point. Just want to stress it again. Um, as your trusted advisor that's independent, we're actually not paid by um, PIMCO, but we truly believe, and, and I was really impressed through the session of PIMCO's expertise in fixed income. So I'm, I hope everyone else also came out of that. And um, I look forward to future sessions um, with PIMCO and hope all of you guys enjoy the session and we'll be hosting more of these uh, for our Hong Kong clients as well. And as I mentioned earlier, if you haven't yet, besides YouTube, feel free to subscribe to our Insights blog, where besides these webinars, you can also get fascinating content that our content team writes and our investment office headed by Sam turns out. So thanks, everyone. I think we're on time. We will wrap up. See you soon. Have a good evening, guys. Thanks, Marcio. Bye, thanks everyone. Evening.